Ja. Good morning, everyone. We have two readings today. The first one is from Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 to 3 and 8 to 6. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that, is not, that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive an inheritance, and he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him from the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, he received power of procreation, even though he was too old and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful because he considered himself, uh, sorry, him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand in a seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of a land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. Our second reading is from Luke chapter 12, verses 32 to 40. Do not be afraid, little flock, for this is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will, also, will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their masters who return from a wedding banquet, so that they may open their doors for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come to serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or, draw, or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But n know this. If the owner of the house had, not, had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, we give thanks. Thank you, Kim, for those readings. David Harmon, the, the chair of co the congregation, uh, will now bring us the homily today. Thank, thank you, Dave, for that. Thank you, John. I could do a sermon where we have the two points of do the right thing and do it all the time. But this, this is a particular opportunity, but particularly with these readings, to weave what I'm about to say into, into where the church finds its safe place in the world um, at this time. So it's going to be a little bit out there. Is that okay? A little bit challenging? I see nodding. This, this is always a, always a good sign. I've, I've prepared a few, a few PowerPoints. Some people are, 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 are graphical uh, in nature and, and, and pictures and, and graphs sometimes are, are helpful. So I hope that's all okay with you. Let's get underway. An accountant dies and goes to heaven. 
St Peter, of course, is there looking through the files and asks a few quick questions. What sort of accountant were you? Oh, I was a CPA, was the reply. Name, asked St Peter. The accountant gives his name and St Peter finds his file. Oh yes, we've been expecting you. You've reached your allotted time span. The accountant says, I don't get it. How can that be? I'm only 48 years old. St Peter looks again at the file and says, well, that's impossible. Why do you say that? asks the accountant. Well, says St Peter, we've been looking over your timesheets and the hours you've charged your clients by our reckoning you must be at least 93 years old. <laughs> the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is a place where your soul goes when you die, provided you've been good. This understanding is woven deeply into the fabric of our society and if you go looking for jokes on heaven, you find that they're all of this ilk, you know, someone dies, they go to heaven, you know, there's pearly gates, there's St Peter there, there's a book, all that type of stuff. And the I'm going to heaven because I believe type of thinking is equally uh, widespread. Heaven apparently is a place of peace, love and community and worship where God is surrounded by a heavenly court and other beings. Such thinking gives us comfort when a loved one dies, but sadly it doesn't align with the teaching of Jesus. We know that Christianity is in decline in Australia and in the Western world in general, and young people are particularly absent from our churches, although I note there are five children here this morning. <laughs> Six, sorry. <laughs> I missed one. Uh, the reasons for this... Indeed a complex, and I don't want to go into this in depth in, uh, this morning, and opinions vary widely on this, but let me offer this this morning. Young people are not interested in having more fear and guilt added to their lives. But they are interested in learning about love, how to be authentic, and how to be happy. They yearn for the freedom, peace and joy that the mystics of the church have spoken about down the centuries. Unfortunately, the church often is not of much help. Kyle, can I have the first slide, please? So this comes directly out of Australian Bureau of Statistics data, and you can see that, um, that it goes up to 2021. So this is... Um, that the most recent data that the Australian Bureau of Statistics has got. So the top line shows the percentage of Australians claiming to practice Christianity when asked that census question. And it's the only census question which you can choose whether you want to answer or not. So in the 1950s, we're up around 90%, and we see this, this gradual decline. It was, it was steep in the early 70s, and we're now at about 44% of the population who answered the um, census saying that they practice Christianity. The bottom line is the number of people who admit that they practice no religion, you can see it's been climbing steadily since the late 1960s. And we're now at about 39% of Australians who say that they practice no religion. Can I have the next slide, please? So that's the people who claim um, to be practicing a religion. This uh, is a graph that I've taken from the National Church Life Survey, and it shows from the 1950s through to about 2019 or 2018, the people... Um, the percentage of the Australian community who claims to be attending monthly religious services. And you can see that this is, has been uh, in steady decline. It looks as though the rate of decline is, is decreasing a little bit uh, in, in the last 10 years or so, but still it's in steady decline. Could we have the next uh, slide, please, Kyle? So this... Um, is a graph showing the age distribution of the 
the general population in Australia, the age distribution of Christians, and the age distribution, which is the dark uh, line, of church attenders, all in 2016. So you can see that um, the, the greatest um, age distributions uh, of church attenders is really between 60 and 80 years. The 15 to 19, 20 to 29 and 30 to 39 years are really underrepresented. So we, we knew this stuff intuitively, right? That, that this, is, this is just um, what, what the actual numbers are saying. Can I have the next slide, please? Up oh, about the black one. Um, so, do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That was the first verse in the, in the gospel reading today. The topic Jesus spoke about most in his ministry was the kingdom of God. The gospels are full of his teaching about the kingdom. Our lectionary gospel readings for the last few weeks remind us that the attainment of the kingdom of God should always be our first concern. Here are some of the topics. Your names are written in heaven. The Good Samaritan. Mary and Martha. Knock and the door will be opened. Store up treasures in heaven. In this week's gospel reading, Jesus reminds us that God wants to give us the kingdom of heaven. But we must remain vigilant because the Son of Man will come at an unexpected time. It's one of those difficult readings, but it's usually the difficult readings from which we ultimately profit the most. Let's work a little at unpacking it. Let's start with the kingdom of heaven. And I have good news for you. The kingdom of heaven is right here, right now, right in front of your eyes. Every one of you. You are seeing it as I speak. In fact, you are seeing it whenever you are awake, wherever you are. It's not some realm off in outer space or up in the sky. It's here and it's now. Jesus told his listeners that the kingdom of God was within each of them and that some of his followers would not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. If this kingdom is all around us and within us, well, why don't we experience it? The answer is tragically simple. We see it, but we just don't recognise it. And what stops us recognising the kingdom of God? It's this thing called me. Our sense of self, our ego. To see God, we need to drop all of the filters we place upon reality and see again with the eyes of a child, through the eyes of innocence, spontaneous, open, authentic. But instead, our ego is tricky and clever. It wants to protect itself at any cost, so it filters out things in order not to cause upset. It desperately seeks recognition and praise and will take crooked measures to get what it wants. And even when it becomes more refined, recognising that the kingdom of God is the ultimate goal, it wants to win God on its own terms. French theologian Jean-Yves Leloup puts it this way. The ego is like a clever monkey which can co-opt anything even the most spiritual practices, so as to expand itself. So what is this kingdom of heaven? It cannot be put into words. It can only be experienced. And anything we say about it is only figurative language, metaphor, not something literally true. So 
Even Jesus had to speak about the kingdom of God through parables, prefacing many of them with, the kingdom of God is like. How many parables have you heard? The kingdom of God is like. And his disciples were desperately wanting to know what it was. And Jesus is trying to say, I can't tell you directly, but I'll give you an analogy. St. Paul comes close when he said poetically that the kingdom of God is justice, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Mystics are people who claim to have achieved the kingdom of God, unifying their will with that of God. They've let go of their egotistical me and dissolved into the universal I forever. Instead of being distraught at this conversion, they instead proclaimed that their me turned out to be a false self and that they'd only found their real identity by surrendering everything to God. And in making this sacrifice, they discover abundant joy and peace and endless energy. Fear has gone forever and there's no anxiety about the future. They have boundless creativity and insight. And they continually remind us that everything is okay. And if we understood the ways of God, we would see that too. Many of us will be familiar with Julianne of Norwich, who famously wrote that all should be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. And St Paul puts it beautifully in Romans, in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. In the reading today, Jesus tells his followers, be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. In other words, to remain aware, to be spiritually alert. Has anyone here this morning been through a potentially life-changing crisis? We might have had a concerning medical diagnosis. A loved one involved in a serious accident. We might have lost all our money. I'm talking about situations where life changes in an instant. Once we know something that we didn't know a few seconds previously. If you've experienced this, you know the type of alertness that Jesus is talking about. Where our mind and our body and our being become completely focused on the present moment with intensity. It's in these moments, isn't it? that what is really important in life becomes glaringly obvious. I often counsel friends going through crises to keep a journal so that they can record their clear vision of what is important to them, what is ordinarily hidden from view when life is ticking along comfortably. Prosperity makes life pleasant but we grow through adversity. I'm not saying that to grow spiritually, that we need to seek crises or purposely hurt ourselves. No, not at all. What I'm saying is that there's a certain type of awareness which arises through crisis, which gives us a glimpse of what's most important to us. Some people develop this awareness through an experience of great beauty. But the wise cultivate this awareness through spirituality. Attaining the kingdom of God is akin to jumping off a series of cliffs of ever increasing height. We can never return. We're not sure if we're going to make it, but we need to trust. In order to deal with our me, we need to face the deepest truths about our own lives. We need to experience how manipulative, deceptive and clever we can be. 
how intolerant, even tyrannical. It's in each of us, but only in facing it can it be overcome, not by repression. And to deal with this, we need to learn to be alone with ourselves. Many people find being out in nature or taking long walks gives them this space. Others like to have a quiet period each day. We need to find a way to open a tap that lets in a deeper awareness of ourselves and we just observe what we notice. At times this will be delightful. At other times we can be surprised or even shocked. The epistle reading this morning begins with, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This process of remaining alert demands a great deal of faith. We continually need to remind ourselves that God is love and God wants to give us the kingdom. We will have had a lot of experiences in life which have given us evidence that these beliefs are true. But are we willing to put them to the test? Are we willing to trust that we can face any truth about ourselves or the world because we know that we are loved and that we are children of God? Knowledge from within can change us instantly. Can we face our fears and jump into the chasm of unknowing to find liberation? This is spiritual growth at its purest. Can I have the next slide, um, please, Kyle? On the vertical axis of this is uh, the population of the world, and you can see that it, it goes a little bit above 7 billion. On the horizontal axis at the bottom is uh, the time. Uh, in years. So it goes back 12,000 years to 10,000 BC. Historians have put this graph together and it shows the growth in the world population over time. So at, in the year Jesus was born there were about 190 million people on the planet. And you can see that there's a bit of a wiggle there with um, uh, various um, pandemics in, in the Middle Ages. When we get to the 1700s, where there's um, the Enlightenment occurs, the Industrial Revolution begins, the world population starts increasing rapidly. So in 2019, we got to 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet. The World Health Organization thinks that we're going to top out about 10 billion people and then there'll be a sort of um, slight reduction as, as the, the world's population um, ages. So as you can see uh, in the last 400 years in particular there's been a huge change, a huge increase in the world's population. Now can we have the next slide please? It's 50 years old this, this year. Um, in 1972 Scientists at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology released a report entitled Limits to Growth. In the 1960s, there were a lot of questions about, well, the, the planet's a finite space, people are growing. Um, can we do some modelling to find out what, what the limits to growth are? So th this is one of those um, publications that's really a, a once-in-a-century work. In the 1900s, it probably would have been on Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. Um, this limits to growth really started a lot of questions about the ozone layer and CO2 concentration, and pollution and limits of resources and whatnot. So they had conducted computer simulations and modelled um, ex ex exponential population and economic growth but with only limited natural resources. And their intention was to change government approaches towards sustainability. 
So they concluded that unless things change, the limits to growth will be reached before 2070. And if the current um, status quo continues, we should expect economic growth to stop by 2030. If things go badly, there'll be a collapse of society around 2040. Now, there have been about half a dozen academic checks of this, the most recent of which was uh, by the economics um, accountancy company KPMG in 2020. And they found that indeed most trends are panning out uh, as, as towards the status quo. So we've really not um, altered our tra trajectory uh, much at all. The current carbon dioxide concentration in the layer is about uh, in the atmosphere is about 400 parts per million. The last time it was at 400 parts per million was four million years ago, where the ocean levels were 20 metres higher. Who knows wh whether this is going to turn out to be accurate or not. I think what we can say is that there's change coming and it's probably the greatest change we've seen in the last 12,000 years. Uh, next slide, please. Tens of thousands of years ago, humanity was not consciously aware of thought, of its use of the mind. But it's common knowledge today. We have philosophy class, um, courses at, at university where it's about thinking. So that's a very well-developed facet in humanity. The next great advance of humanity will be becoming aware of its inner spiritual nature, of discovering the kingdom of God within. We've spoken about how personal crisis can give rise to this heightened state of awareness about things inside us. But but the sort of change that's coming will likely bring about that awareness at a, at, a, at a global level. Steady growth in global crises is bound to cause an awakening to the life within. And this is where the church can be reborn. This is where the church can be reborn, acting as a midwife to usher in the birth of spiritual awareness of our greatest needs. Amazing things can become possible if we can make this transition together. We need a change of direction in our churches and soon. We need to discern the pressing needs in our societies. Churches need to stop using theology as a means of justifying outdated belief systems and instead use it in the search for truth. We need to come back again and again to the hard parts of scripture and sit with them until they make sense as viewed through the lens of the love of God. When practiced regularly, remaining spiritually alert becomes second nature to us. And one day the Son of Man arrives by surprise and the doors to the kingdom open. And we will know without a shadow of a doubt that we are daughters and sons of God. It's a brand new world. I'd like to finish with a quote from St. Teresa of Avila, a Spanish uh, mystic of the um, of the 1500s may today there be peace within may you trust God that you are exactly where you are meant to be may you not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith may you use those gifts that you have received and pass on the love that's been given to you. May you be content knowing that you are a child of God. Let this presence settle into your bones 
and allow your soul the freedom to sing, dance, praise and love. It is there for each and every one of us. Amen.